Hello there, I'm Dr. Kath Price here again, and today we're going to look at our feathered neighbours. Uh, these are what we call commensal species, the birds that live around our homes. Um, we could look at several species of commensals. Uh, there's the house martins that nest up under your eaves. Swifts usually nest in buildings. Swallows also around buildings. But the real true one that shares our lives is the house sparrow. The rest of them, they're migrants. They come in for the summer and then we lose them again for the winter. And while they're around, they're a bit sort of distant. But the house sparrow is truly sharing our life. They, they eat similar things. They eat anything. I mean, you can't feed swallows and martins. But if you put food out in the garden, the chances are you're going to see how sparrows. And of course, they're, they're like us in a way because they live in flocks, they're communal, um, they spend a lot of time squabbling and bickering around the place, and they remind us of ourselves. So, house sparrows, wonderful things. Don't really need to describe them to you. Everybody knows what a house sparrow looks like. He's a little fairly dull, brown, grey, black, and the females um, a sort of muted version. The, the male ones have this wonderful black bib, and um, they're quite smart little birds. The only one really you'd mistake them for in this country would be tree sparrows. Uh, here's a, a couple of tree sparrows on feeder down at the bottom right here. And as you can see, they're a bit like somebody's designed a house sparrow and then decided they could make a better job of it. So they're a bit tidier, they're a bit smaller and neater. They have a lovely chestnut cap and these black beauty marks on their cheeks. Um, males and females are the same in tree sparrows, but quite different in house sparrows. There's a, a, a nice pair of them here in a, in a budding elder tree. They eat grain most of the year, they eat seeds, but the, the young ones, the chicks in the nest, are usually fed on insects and um, insect larvae, caterpillars and things. <coughs> Little female one here with a with a with a feather for a nest, and they they're neat little birds, and they don't sing. They have a rather repetitive cheep. If you've got them nesting in your roof, um, they'll probably drive you absolutely balmy. Um, but very sociable to each other, so they they cheep all the time, and when the male has found a nesting site, he'll cheep next to it to call his lady to come and inspect it. They pair for life and they're very loyal to their nesting site. They're sedentary, they don't migrate, they don't move around very much. So a sparrow in your garden has probably been fledged from a nest somewhere very close by. And okay, they pair for life, but they're not really quite what you'd call monogamous. Um, they're actually highly promiscuous. 15% um, of the young in a nest um, are probably from what biologists call very politely extra pair matings. Um, so the funny thing is that sparrows always have a reputation of being promiscuous. They're not very shy about fornicating in public, so you'll, you'll see them. The interesting thing is that when you see them happily mating on your bird table or your picnic bench or wherever, that will be the actual monogamous pair mating. They're much sneakier about um, extra pair mating. So they obviously have a little feeling that it's not quite right. They're, they're communal nesters, 
they, they, they like to nest in close proximity with other house sparrows. And unpaired birds will act as helpers to breeding pairs. So they have a sort of family bond. It's like having aunties and uncles as babysitters and um, helping bring some food in and things. <clears throat> they have rather messy nests, um, quite often including rubbish and string and things like this. And there was one recorded actually that was made entirely out of cassette tape. Now, I shouldn't think it had much thermal value, but um, it probably made quite a secure nest. Four to five eggs laid at a time, and they can have three clutches a year in places like Britain. In warmer places, they actually will breed more frequently. And here's one feeding a, a, a young one. You can recognise the young ones by the, uh, the yellow sides of its mouth, it's the, the gape. Now, they've been associated with people for at least 10,000 years, 11,000 years so far. They, they've been associated with people since the discovery of the, the, the adoption of agriculture. So they originated in the Near East, in the area where agriculture was developed. And they spread with agriculture. They all descended from the same lineage, but there are subspecies. This is one of them. This is this is um, a non-commensal house sparrow. So this is one that doesn't like people. And this is Bactrianus sparrow. And these are very interesting because they're genetically very similar, <clears throat> but they are probably. Um, more like the original sparrows before they discovered humans. And there's been a, a very, very interesting piece of research um, by Mark Ravinet and his colleagues in Oslo, which shows that it's compared the, the genetics of this non commensal house sparrow, the Bactrianus sparrow, which is shy, it's migratory, it doesn't like people, it doesn't come near people. And they compared the genetics of this bird with the house sparrow we know. And they found all sorts of interesting things. And this is a comparison of the skulls of them. The one on the left is our house sparrow, if you like, the, the commensal species. And the one on the right is the non commensal one. And as you can see, the skull in the commensal house sparrows has become broader, more robust, and the little points of bone that are marked out by letters here are muscle attachments, which gave it, gives, it, gives it a stronger bite. So basically, if you got bitten by a house sparrow in the garden here, it would give you a much heftier bite than if you got bitten by a Bactriana sparrow. This is because they make, as humans domesticated crops, wheat, from the original emma and einkorn wheats, the grains got harder, harder and starchier. And the genetics of sparrows has, the genetic development, the evolution, has allowed them to use the same foods as we're growing for ourselves. So not only do they have a genetic um, alteration that changes the shape of the skull and, and gives it a harder bite, but also one that allows it to digest much starchier food. They've actually domesticated themselves. And these ge genetic changes um, are very similar to the ones that you see in domestication of dogs. So, um, I mean, Domestication of dogs has led to a vast amount of species, well, you know, the same species, but the different forms, different bodily forms. But they, what, what's happened is they, they developed from having the long, fine skull that a wolf has to having a, a shorter, more robust skull, so it can eat different food. And also they can digest 
starch much better. So very similar process in the domestication. The interesting thing, of course, is that sparrows have done it themselves. Um, you know, they, the people haven't domesticated sparrows, but they, they, sparrows have domesticated themselves. Around 6,000 years ago, as agriculture spread through Europe, there was an enormous increase in the numbers of sparrows, and they, they, they went with the farming cultures. So they spread from the Near East, right across Europe and down into Africa, right across to the Near East, the Far East, and the places they didn't manage to get to themselves, we've actually introduced them. So they've been taken to Australia, New Zealand, and to America, where they were imported as a pest control. <clears throat> and once they got to these new places, they spread incredibly rapidly. And they, they're actually still regarded as a pest species in America. Um, if you go online and look up house sparrows, most of the American things will be telling you how to control them, how to get rid of them. So they've had an enormous amount of success. They don't like very, very cold places. They're absent from the Arctic and the Antarctic, um, but they've got just about everywhere else. They've been found in all sorts of different places. They've been found nesting on the 80th floor of the Empire State Building. And 2,000 feet down in a coal mine in Yorkshire, where they survived mainly on scraps from the miners' lunch. Some of them have been recorded living their entire lives inside a warehouse. So very, very successful um, due to their um, association with people. Because of their association with this, there's quite a lot of mythology and symbolism around sparrows. Um, much more than for some of the more obvious and more flamboyant birds. Um, in ancient Egypt, there was a hieroglyph depicting a sparrow. And this is on the top right here, the, the black and white lines. That was how they would depict a sparrow in their writings. And the meaning of it was small or narrow or even bat. So obviously Egypt was a great grain producing area, sparrows were a pest. Um, these ones being a pest in Egypt here with some, with some hieroglyphics. Unfortunately, not one of sparrow, but we can't have it happening. In Europe, <clears throat> they've been associated with um, both lechery and promiscuity and also with with love they were associated with venus and aphrodite the gods of love in um roman roman and greek mythology and as a symbol of love they're, they're depicted here as um this is lesbia with her pet sparrow they were kept by roman courtesans as pets because of their symbolism of love. There's actually um, Lesbia and uh, Lesbia's and uh, Pet Sparrow is an ode by Catullus who wrote dodgy verse in Latin. My Latin teacher said it was really the only way you could get teenage boys to learn Latin. But bye bye. There she is with her pet sparrow. They're actually quite difficult to keep as pets. They don't sing, they're hard to rear, but even so, people have persisted in making pets of them. Later on in Christianity, this is um, this is Madonna with with, with a sparrow. Um, they were seen as um, emblematic of the unhappiness of the human condition. Uh, sparrows were lowly. Sparrows are the unvaluable. They're they're, they're symbolic of the um, the base instinct of instinct of humans. And in this picture, the sparrow is actually tied by a fine golden thread to the finger of the Christ child, um, which apparently is really to symbolize the fact that um, the sparrow is being kept from falling into evil ways. But of course, the Bible also has the thing about not even a sparrow falls 
without being noticed. So this one is being kept from falling by having the fine golden thread. But nice to see them depicted in art. They were also, um, in, in this country, they're thought to be bad luck. If one flies into your house, it would um, symbol, symbolise that you, you can expect a, a death in the near future. But in Indonesia, for example, it's good luck if it flies into your house. So, you know, take your choice, really. Um, I've only ever had one come into the house uh, that fell down the chimney into the wood burner. Fortunately, it did it when the wood burner wasn't lit and when I was in the room. So I heard this noise coming down the chimney and opened the door of the wood burner and there it was sitting in the grate looking at me. And it came out quite happily and flew away. Uh, nobody died. So, you know, I think we can take that with a bit of a pinch of salt. They were also thought to be carriers of the soul. So after death, they were one of the birds that was seen as transporting the immortal soul off to wherever it was going to. And sailors had tattoos of them showing sparrows in the hope that this would mean that if they died at sea, their soul would be taken home. But their main thing was that in, in, in literature, Chaucer and Shakespeare both used them as symbols of lechery and promiscuity. So I mean, Chaucer described somebody as, as hot he was and lecherous as a sparrow. So they have all sorts of meanings all over the world. But the fact that they have those meanings is because they are with us all the time. They're, they're familiar. And you can see why. In this, this painting shows how you know, life, life in medieval times would have been. It's an absolute paradise for sparrows. It's got grain to pick up to steal from the chickens. It's, it's probably got a vegetable patch around the back they can maraud in. And it's got all that lovely thatch. Um, this is a perfect nesting place for a sparrow. Um, these days, thatches tend to have a, a, a wire mesh covering on them to stop the sparrows getting in because they do make an awful mess of it. And you would feel less kindly towards your sparrows if your roof was being ripped up by them. You can just imagine a good solid colony of sparrows wreaking havoc in there. Of course, they were seen as, I mean, it's not just making a mess of your thatch, they were seen as a great pest of um, garden produce agricultural produce and um, in 1880 the, the Shropshire ornithologist William Beckwith described them as causing mischief beyond calculation so they controlled them they netted them this is a, a, a fine net you could you could easily catch an awful a lot of sparrows at one go because they sit around in flocks. Um, there were sparrow clubs which um, provided an annual cup for the person who had killed the most sparrows and there was a bounty offered for which was paid on the presentation of the head of a sparrow. Um, and of course they were slaughtered in huge numbers, but they breed fast and there was plenty of food for them, so it doesn't really affect them too badly. They also ate them. Once you'd got your sparrow and you'd chopped its head off and taken it off to, um, to the local magistrate to claim your money, you'd got the remains of a sparrow, which was seen as perfectly edible. Small birds were eaten quite readily in um, in medieval times and really right up until the 19th century. Um, lots of recipes for sparrows. Uh, I found an absolutely wonderful one that suggests that they weren't they weren't poverty food, they were 
um, they were also prepared in quite posh ways. And um, this is an Elizabethan recipe, and they were prepared in mutton broth with whole mace and pepper. Remember, these are very expensive things in those days. With claret and marigold leaves, berberries, rose water, verjuice, vinegar, sugar, and marrow or sweet butter. So it was quite a complicated recipe. So it wasn't it wasn't just you weren't just eating them because you had nothing else. Lots of people did, of course. Um, these days, uh, I read it's, apparently it's a bit like eating a bundle of um, toothpicks. But you know, tastes change. These are sparrow boxes, and they weren't really providing a nice nesting place for the sake of sparrows. They were providing somewhere that made sparrows terribly easy to catch. So you'd have a selection of these put up around your house. And as you can see from the back of it, you could lift it off the book and access the inside. So you could have sparrows eggs, recipes for sparrows eggs omelets. You need an awful lot of them, but there were lots about. Or the very young birds, the, the newly fledged fat young birds. So, you know, in some ways, they were a good thing, especially if in times of famine, you could find something to eat if you got a few sparrows about. They were also seen in a positive light. In London, there were huge numbers of sparrows, the Cockney sparrows. People identified with them. They, the, 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 the poor people saw these little underdogs of sparrows as similar to themselves. So, this is St. James's Park. You, you won't see this now. You might have one or two around, but these big flocks really are a thing of the past. But they did make themselves very much at home in the cities, and people appreciated them being there. It's, it's, it's interesting. We, we tend to treasure rare things. If you think you know, gold and silver are treasured, tin isn't. Common things are rather despised. And even ornithologists don't always like sparrows. They, they um, complain about them taking over the, the nests of, of what they see as more valuable birds. Um, they will take over other birds' nests. I had a, an interesting query last week from a gentleman who had sparrows trying to get into a blue tip box. The blue tip box was used every year, and obviously the entrance hole of it was too small for a sparrow to get into, but they were having a damn good try. If they can get in, they will destroy the nests and eggs of other birds. So they were a bit unpopular. Is it because there were so many of them? Um, Simon Barnes coined a lovely phrase of, of um, reaching cultural carrying capacity. The, the carrying capacity to biologists is how many an environment will support, or also, you know, if, how many cows you can fit on your farm, perhaps. So, as many as can be sustained by the environment is the carrying capacity. The cultural carrying capacity is at what point we stop valuing them and start despising them, not liking them. So perhaps they reached their cultural carrying capacity. But this gentleman's obviously enjoying their company, so it's a good thing. They weren't monitored at all before the mid-1970s. And but then it's been noticed since then that numbers really are going down. In, in rural places, they've nearly halved, but in towns and cities, they've gone down much more. Because of such large population declines, the, the, it's now red listed as a species and of high conservation concern. And people say, oh, well, you know, why is it red listed? I still seen plenty, but you've lost that many. It is of conservation concern particularly in the big cities. In London, they've gone down by 75% between 1994 and 2004. This is a gradual decline in um, gardens all over the country. So this is rural and urban. The reasons are 
mm, not well known. Um, a lot of things have been suggested, increased predation by cats and magpies and sparrowhawks, because magpies and sparrowhawks are a lot more um, common now than, because gamekeepers aren't killing them. Um, unleaded petrol um, has a, an additive in it that uh, replacing the lead, which is toxic and carcinogenic um, in, in, in animals. <clears throat> the garden pesticides, which are in the seeds and grains that the birds are eating, and also killing off the insects that the young need to grow and fledge. Everything's been tidied up. Farmyards aren't so messy now. Grain silos are enclosed. Less horses in the city. The sparrows used to do very well on spilt nose bags and picking through horse droppings on the, in, the street, in the streets from, from the working horses, the draft horses. And of course, they're not there, so the food isn't there. Modern roofing's a problem. The, um, one of their favorite places, once we stopped having thatches, is under the tiles of roofs or under the soffit boards, these sort of places, in little nooks and crannies. Um, plastic soffit boards, of course, they don't decay in the same way. You don't get the holes in them. And um, so modern roofing is basically evicting the sparrows from their traditional nesting places. There's a suggestion that the electromagnetic waves from mobile phones, and particularly from the um, phone masts, are affecting sparrows in their navigation and their, their breeding. And also they, they, they will avoid these um, um, phone masts. So mobile phones might be causing some of the decline. Disease, where you get large populations, you get disease. Sparrows in London have been found to be affected by avian malaria. Um, you know, a lot of them. And the other interesting suggestion was that people don't shake the tablecloths outside anymore. So the sparrows aren't getting the crumbs. These are, these are all things that they've come from the, the independent newspaper has a Save Our Sparrows campaign and they've offered a £5,000 reward for anybody that can come up with a scientific paper that actually proves what is causing the decline. But so far, no, I don't think anybody's claimed it. We've got lots of ideas, but we really don't know very well. The worrying thing is that is the sparrow the modern day canary in the coal mine? is the fact that they're dying out in cities these affected by all the, you know, the potential of all these different things particularly things that we can't see like the mobile phones and the unleaded petrol are they warning us are these things that are actually going to harm us as well as city dwellers so it's worth noticing the decline of even the smallest bird The decline in India has been such that they decided we needed a World Sparrow Day, which has been celebrated on the 20th of March since 2010. And all things sparrow are celebrated on that day. There's been schemes in London to increase sparrow populations again, um, turning parts of London parks into meadows to provide seed and attract insects because chicks were found to be dying of starvation and dehydration in the nest because of the lack of insects. So these areas in parks are being converted to provide suitable food. Farm agri-environmental schemes are including in, in, encouraging farmers to keep stubbles and to grow uh, wildflower strips on field edges which again will help the sparrows by providing food for them particularly the young ones and of course there's lots of things you can do yourself um, providing food for 
for, for, for the sparrows. Um, they, they, they will readily take grain from hanging bird feeders. This was from one of the American sites about how to get rid of them. And this is actually one of those fancy squirrel proof feeders that if you get sufficient weight on the bottom of it, it closes the grain ports. I don't know how many sparrows you need to make enough weight to shut them. It might work, but it might not. But in this country, you know, we want to see them. So, you know, put out some grain. They like somewhere to bath. They're very keen on bathing. Um, so a bird bath will encourage them and also give them somewhere to drink. And they like to dust bathe. It's great fun to see them. If you've got a, 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 sort of a, a dusty path or something, they'll be there fluttering around in it, having a good roll, having a good scratch. And they do this to get rid of the pests in their feathers. Um, and the lice and things that birds naturally have. Um, they, they have a, a good scrut around in it and it keeps them comfortable. And then they'll have a good fluff and they'll preen their feathers and it, it gets all the dirt out. So great thing to see, really, really enjoyable. Nest boxes are great for them. You can get these days, you can get specialised sparrow nest boxes with the, uh, com for the communal nesting. These are, have the, this, this one with three entrances. Some of them have an entrance in the front and one on each end. Um, take your pick, really. If you put them up under the eaves of your house, it's a natural place for sparrows to go to. So that's a really good spot to have them. Um, it's also just suggested that unlike most birds, nest boxes, you shouldn't clean them out. Sparrows are actually very, very clean nesters and they will reuse the same nest year after year. So once they're in there, don't disturb them and don't clear the nest out at the end of the year. This was a design I particularly like. This is the original Spar Sparrow Box Company. Uh, I don't think you can actually buy them as a private individual yet, but they're designed to look like thatch. This is the sparrows, remember it's their favourite place and the box looks like a nice thatch group. So particularly nice design, I think. You can put up ordinary um, whole nest boxes. 32 millimetres is the right size of hole for, for house sparrows. And if you put them in, up in a group like this, it allows the sparrow community to stay together. And you can also get ones that you can build into walls. So if you're um, having an extension done or something, and you're worried that the roof repairs are going to um, stop your sparrows nesting there, you can actually build in a special, specially built wood creep box, build it into the wall, and it will replace the nesting space that sparrows have lost. Or you could just not worry too much about cracks and things in your roof and let the sparrows enjoy them. That's what I do. Here's one that really takes after those sparrow pots that people were using to catch sparrows to eat. And the sparrow is quite happy with it. But don't forget that they don't really see the box. What they're looking for is a hole. They're looking for a cavity. And they don't mind what it looks like. But a little clay pot like this is a rather lovely thing. Um, you know, it, 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 you want these things to be attractive in your garden as well as attractive to birds. It's got to look good. So, yeah, you could try some of these. You could have several of them in a row. It would be lovely. The main thing is, though, to appreciate your sparrows. And stop thinking of them as a pest. I don't, most people don't these days. The old farmer might, but um, you know, they're not doing any, any damage and they're part of our lives. Another thing Simon Barnes says is that birds that can adapt to humanity have a far more secure future than those that can't. And this is a bird that is totally adapted to humanity that perhaps doesn't have a secure future. I know in my garden now there are many more goldfinches than there are house sparrows. And I can remember when it was the other way around. So look after your sparrows. 
look after the habitats of sparrows. Encourage everybody to do their bit for them, even if it may mean I can understand why people want their roofs not to be falling to bits, but do put up some nest boxes to allow the sparrows to go on breeding. They don't want to move. They want to stay in the same place. They like being at home. Very much home creatures, they're part of our lives. They've always been part of our lives. We've always been part of their lives. So look after your sparrows. Help us to look after the environment so there's plenty of food for them and encourage the decline that is, is actually slowing. There seems to be a very small increase in the last few years or so. Help us to encourage it. If you do one thing, join the Wildlife Trust it can make a real difference to all these different species that need somewhere to live. And you can, you can do this by clicking on the link in the video description at the bottom there somewhere. Or if you go online and find Shropshire Wildlife Trust, you can have the join us there bit there too. So do have a think about it. We want lots of sparrows, we want lots of different species all over the county. So do one thing, join the Wildlife Trust and keep watching our videos, please. Thank you very much.